Hi guys, last time we talked about some different pesticides and how they're used and some problems that could go along with that. So today we're going to look at some alternatives to those pesticides, some things that we can do instead as another option. So remember that our goal here is working towards a sustainable agroecosystem, so a way to fit farming for our own needs in with preserving the environment so that we can use its resources for many years to come. And this is basically working towards a second green revolution one that works along with the environment while also increasing our yield so that we can feed more people. Um, so some main things that we want to try to do in this second green revolution are preserve the fertility of the soil by doing things like crop rotation um, to make sure we have enough nutrients preventing erosion through those best management practices that we've talked about, preserving biodiversity, trying to grow polycultures and not monocultures, managing our water resources wisely so things like pesticides and fertilizers don't wind up contaminating them, and also emphasizing this whole systematic response. So we're looking at things and how they fit all together and trying to be as in sync with the way things naturally work and cycle um, rather than trying to just do little things here and there to improve our own yields. Right, so one of these approaches that could work towards this is organic farming. Um, and organic farming, by definition, is not the same as natural farming. So you need to make that distinction. The word natural is not regulated by the USDA, but the word organic is. So organic means that these plants and animals are produced without using these synthetic chemicals like hormones, pesticides. Um, that term natural does not necessarily mean any of those things. It's not regulated. So when you see that word on a product, you want to be kind of skeptical because it doesn't necessarily have one particular definition. It's kind of up to interpretation. The organic foods, on the other hand, are governed by this particular law, the Organic Food Production Act of 1990, and they have to be, if it's a plant, has to be grown in soil um, that has not had any sort of commercial organic, inorganic fertilizer or pesticide in it for at least three years, and actually in some cases when they're converting from um, more of a conventional type um, situation, they may have to wait up to 10 years to be certified organic. Um, if you're certified organic, your land has been inspected and they have confirmed that there are no unauthorized chemicals going into these plants. Um, if it, you're talking about organic livestock, those are not going to be treated with antibiotics or hormones. They are going to be fed organic um, fodder as well and they need to be humanely raised and handled and by definition that means they need to get some fresh air and ex exercise. Now that's a little bit different than free range and there are some different definitions that go along. One other thing to note is that organic food cannot be genetically modified by law. So it has to be, it can be selectively bred but it has to be in a somewhat original state. Um, so some of the ways you can pick out organic foods are they will tell you if they were 100% or organic and usually the companies are very um, they want to market this they want to say that they have put this time in to get this 100% organic seal so it's an optional sticker that you can get on there but most of them are going to tell you right out if it just says organic that means that probably it's not 100% organic but at least 95% of it is in some cases they will say made with organic ingredients so at that point you have at least 70% being organic and in some cases it will tell you that there is less than 70% organic ingredients as well um, when you're looking at produce codes you always want to look at how many digits are in the code if there it is only a four digit code it tells you it's conventionally grown probably pesticides have touched that produce at some point within its life um, so you always want to make sure that you wash those well so that no residues wind up getting into your body. Um, if you do get organic food, you're going to notice it has a five-digit code and it starts with a nine. There are also five-digit codes for genetically modified foods, but these ones start with an eight. So that's how you can tell them apart. Um, and that can be really useful when you're making some personal choices to try to decide what types of things you're going to So when you're trying to decide if organics are worth it, you should really kind of compare organic farming to conventional farming. In conventional farming, they're going to be using lots of those inorganic commercial fertilizers. And those things we've talked about can cause eutrophication. The production of those fertilizers can cause acid rain, all sorts of things like that.
Um, with organic farming, they're still applying natural fertilizers, so they could still be throwing off the balance of nutrients in the soil, but they're usually they're organic sources. They're things like manure, compost. So they tend to be a little bit closer to the natural ecosystem in the first place. In conventional farming, they're spraying synthetic insecticides. Um, in organic farming, they may still spray some pesticides, but they will be from natural sources like plant botanicals, and they're much more likely to use some of the IPM, integrated pest management techniques that we're gonna talk about later. Um, with conventional farming, they're again going to use those synthetic herbicides, and organic farming is going to try to find other ways to get rid of um, weeds. So in many cases it may be hand weeding or finding other ways to get rid of them. And in conventional farming we do have that use of antibiotics and growth hormones and medications being used to prevent disease in livestock. In organic farming they try to avoid using these as much as possible. Um, and in fact they can't wind up um, publishing it as organic food if they do have if they have used these things in the process. They also try to do things like try not to keep them too cramped up so that they don't spread disease um, within a cramped pen. Um, rotational grazing where they are only on a certain piece of land for a certain amount of time so that they don't um, spread a parasite through that ground area or anything like that. Um, so when you're looking at these things, you have to kind of think about how much that means to you um, and how much at risk you feel you are. And there are certain plants and animals that are more likely to have some sort of residue on them that could be harmful to you. So there is a list called the Dirty Dozen, um, which are the plants that are basically most likely to have these pesticide residues on them. So you can see your list of them there. There's also the Clean 15, which is kind of the opposite of that. These are the ones that are going to have the least pesticide residue. And you can see that a lot of them are either protected by a very thick skin or they're underground. So a lot of the pesticides would not necessarily get through into there. So a lot of people advocate that you should buy the Dirty Dozen organic and then those Clean 15, you don't have to worry too much about it and that can save you some money. Um, it's also something that you need to think about when you're buying dairy or any kind of meat products. Um, what are the sort of benefits? What are the trade-offs? So this is just one particular um, graphic from Stonyfield Farm, which is an organic company, so obviously there may be a little bit of bias here. Um, but you can see that some of these chemicals that we talked about last time are being used to raise the food for the cow. And there is that always that question, is that residue winding up in your meat somewhere? So this is something that you have to weigh and make a personal decision about. Some of the benefits of organic farming is that it's much more close to a natural ecosystem. So it helps us get back to that agro ecosystem and minimize our negative environmental impacts. And in addition, we know that the food is not going to contain these artificial compounds. Now, it's very possible that conventional farming would also produce food without these artificial compounds. And the research has not really shown that organic farming is always better um, or more nutritious. So it's one of those things you have to sort of decide for yourself until we get more data. Another thing I want to point out is that organic farming does not mean small-scale local farming all the time. In many cases it is, but it can also be a big business. And I want to just show you some of the companies here that are um, popular natural food companies. They all fall under these larger companies that also use a lot of conventional methods. So these organic farms might still be factory farms and they might still be raised in monocultures. They can still require massive amounts of energy. They can still be very detrimental to the environment when they're done at this scale. In addition, there's some consumer pushback to organic foods. Um, organic is often seen as trendy, kind of standoffish, too expensive. So lower income families may not be able to buy organic food in the first place because of a price restriction. Even when they can afford it, they're sometimes very culturally predisposed, predisposed to um, distrust it. And they're going to tend to choose conventional produce instead. There's a particular example I'm thinking of where they tried to take away the normal grocery store in a town in Vermont and put in a co-op. 
and actually the prices were cheaper the food was organic it was locally raised but there was a huge pushback in the community because they hadn't grown up on food like that and they wanted their normal grocery store back um, and price is of course an issue it does cost more usually for organic food because it costs more to produce it in the first place and it costs quite a bit to get that USDA certification in the first place so it really does come down to a personal choice and you should always of course research the options before you decide what you would like to do for yourself now when we start looking at some other alternatives to pesticides one of them is biopesticides and that would encourage include naturally occurring substances that control pests such as biochemical pesticides that would include using microorganisms to control pests uh, which is known as microbial pesticides and also pesticidal substances that are produced by plants that contain added genetic material um, so those are called plant incorporated protectants or PIPs and these are pesticidal substances that are produced naturally by plants um, and they will take this gene and insert it into another plant so that it now is able to uh, produce this pesticidal protein so BT is an example of that they take the BT gene that um, occurs naturally in these soil bacteria that will poison certain worms and things like that and they put it into corn plants and that helps the plants protect itself from these predators and another alternative and the one that we're going to spend most of the time here on is integrated pest management or IPM so integrated pest management rather than just treating with pesticides it takes a whole systems approach and looks at the pest and how it's impacting the environment and the agricultural system and tries to figure out how to maximize the yield and maximize the profit while minimizing the environmental impact so IPM is basically designed to manage pests, but not to eradicate pests. They're not trying to totally get rid of them. It does require a lot of knowledge of how the pest interacts with that ecosystem. And you can see from this graph that in many cases, IPM is even more effective than using pesticides when it's done properly. But as we said, it is a system approach. So it is done continually. You're not going to ever be done doing IPM. It will change over time. All farmers basically practice IPM in some way, but some know more about it than others. Um, and as new pest control techniques are discovered, the people who are trying to design the IPM schedule have to keep adjusting their program. Um, so this is going to change as technology comes about. Um, so to be effective, IPM really requires you to know the pest's life cycle, feeding habits, travel, nesting habits, all sorts of things like that. It also requires you think about the timing of your planting, cultivation, and your different control treatments that you're going to um, impose. So there's six basic components of IPM programs. You have to keep monitoring the pest levels and keep good records to see how patterns change over time. Then you keep changing your action level, which basically um, tells you what population size is really going to be detrimental to you and when you actually need to try to implement one of those controls. Prevention is the most important aspect of IPM. You always want to try to prevent a pest rather than controlling it afterwards. Um, and then if the prevention methods haven't worked, then you go and you take some action um, to try to minimally affect the environment but still get rid of the pest. And then you always want to be evaluating the action you take and figure out when you're done and you don't have to do it anymore. So the main goal of IPM is to keep pests below the economic injury level, which is basically the point where it costs too much money um, to have the pests there and you're not going to be profitable anymore. So in other words, no one's going to want to spend $25 to control a pest that's going to cause $20 worth of damage. It doesn't make economic sense. So this economic injury level is basically the break-even point when the cost of control equals the amount of damage. And you want to make sure that you keep that amount of damage lower than the cost of the control or, or around about the same amount, ideally. Um, then you have this term economic threshold, which is basically the concept um, that pest populations have to stay at a certain size 
in order to prevent reaching that injury level. So this is really what they're trying to keep the pest level at is that economic threshold, um, that level where you can keep the c population under control without it costing you a lot of money to do so. So as we've said, you have to have a lot of knowledge about the pest. You have to know its habits, know its enemies, and know its weaknesses. IPM is a very tactical sort of uh, management method. Um, and then you're going to employ a variety of controls. So one of those types of controls is biological controls, which we've talked about already, where you bring in another um, organism in the ecosystem and use their natural enemy against them. So many of them already have natural enemies in their ecosystem, but when you put them into rows of crops, for some reason those enemies aren't present or they're not present in high enough numbers. So growers can do things like change the environment to attract these natural enemies, or they can actually bring them in from elsewhere. But we know that sometimes that's sort of a dangerous uh, proposition because it can really it can lead to these invasive species to biotic pollution in cases like the cane toad. So it's something that you need to be careful of. Uh, one of those types of biological controls is actually using disease organisms. So using a bacteria, using a virus uh, to control pests. Of course, this always runs the risk that it could spread to other related organisms in the ecosystem as well. So it's also fairly tricky. Cultivation methods are probably one of the best ways to control these. So one way that you can reduce damage from pests is to intercrop um, different species of plants. So to have a polyculture like that where you're raising different things in different areas. Um, so for example, when corn was interplanted with molasses grasses in an experiment in Kenya, only about 5% of the corn crop was damaged compared to 39% damage in a control field that was just a monoculture of corn. So this molasses grass that they planted it with repels some insects, it attracts wasps, that laid their eggs inside the corn borers, and then those insects um, were able to attack the ones that were destroying the mature corn stalks. So having these different species in the area can help. Um, another technique that's used in alfalfa particularly is strip cutting, and that's shown here. Um, and that's when only one segment of the crop is harvested at a time, and the unharvested portion basically provides an undisturbed habitat for natural predators and parasites. Um, and, and because they're not disturbed in that area, they're not as likely to spread to other areas. You also can do things like timing, planting, fertilization, and irrigating properly so that they are not going to um, allow those parasites or those pests to take hold. Another type of control is genetic controls, and we tend to think of this as genetically modified organisms, but it's not always something that's genetically engineered. It could just be done through traditional selective breeding, um, and basically what would happen there is that you would identify plants that um, were present where the pest is common, but didn't get damaged by the pest, and then you would take those resistant plants and cross those with your crop varieties to try to produce a pest-resistant crop. Um, but it can take a long time. So that's part of the reason why genetic engineering has become more popular, because it's much quicker, it's much easier to isolate a particular gene and make sure that that winds up in your plant. Um, so for instance, if you are trying to produce a toxin in the plant that is naturally toxic to the pest, um, or in other words, you're trying to increase the host plant resistance, um, then it's much quicker and easier to do that genetically. Um, you can also genetically engineer the pest itself to either be sterile or for some reason not be able to harm the plant. Uh, now, we've talked about this in class and we've seen that there's all sorts of unintended impacts that this could have and the jury is still out on many of them because we haven't had enough research yet um, to really prove that it's safe. So this is one of those um, kind of touchy areas, um, but it is said that this gene revolution could really help us to Im increase our yield significantly um, and grow safer crops with less pests. Our next control method is mechanical or physical control, uh, where you're physically preventing the pest from reaching or eating the host organism, or you're making conditions unsuitable for the pest to survive, doing things like changing the oxygen levels, humidity levels, or actually trapping the pests. So this uses machinery or other tools. Uh, in some cases, it could be done by hand, such as when you physically weed out um, the weeds that you don't want in your garden. 
Um, the disadvantage of these controls is that they take a lot of physical labor, um, so they can take a lot of human effort to accomplish. Then we have sanitary controls, which are methods that we use to prevent the pest from ever getting into the field in the first place. So just doing simple things like making sure your machinery is clean so that you don't spread pests from one place to another, buying and planting certified seeds that have been tested to make sure they don't have any pathogens or pests in them, and quarantining uh, products in certain areas if you think that they may be contaminated with a pet. So often hand in hand with sanitary control will be legal controls such as the Plant Quarantine Act of 1912. Basically there are federal laws um, that have been enacted to make sure that all fruits and vegetables imported into the U.S. have to receive some form of either fumigation, heat treatment, um, some sort of controlled storage, radiation exposure, or they have to be quarantined for a certain length of time before that produce can be sold in the U.S. Um, and that's designed to kill whatever pest species might be present on the produce um, to make sure that it doesn't wind up in our fields here. And it doesn't work 100% of the time, but it has helped keep us safe from a lot of the pests that we see in other countries. It's also why you have to disclose if you are carrying any food items when you are flying across international borders. I'm sure some of you have seen that form before that you have to fill out. All right, our next type of controls are natural controls. Um, and these are basically trying to take advantage of any kind of naturally occurring pest management that's already in the environment. So really exploiting those natural enemies, those predators, those parasites that might come in and kill your pest for you. So there's lots of examples of bees, ladybugs, probably one of the most popular ones um, because they will eat the aphids on things like lettuce plants um, and prevent that pest from taking over your crop. But there's lots of different examples here of these beneficial insects, and those would all be considered natural controls. And then we have cultural controls, where you're using the pest's behavior against them. So you're doing things like manipulating how they find their food or how they complete their life cycle. So things like draining mosquito breeding grounds, draining that water so that they cannot uh, lay eggs in there, or rotating crops so that soil-dwelling pests can't feed on the next crop of the same type of produce. Um, so there's kind of two categories of cultural control, things that either optimize the growing conditions for the crop and give it a competitive edge and that allows it to outcompete the pest, or things that actually create unfavorable conditions for the pest itself. So things like using appropriate fertilizers and plant spacing um, and also the timing of the planting and the variety of plants that you select can all be considered cultural controls. So as we said, timing of these different applications can be very important. Um, lots of pests go through a particular life cycle where they're going to be very predictable and things are going to happen at certain times. So if you can take advantage of that, that can help to kill them off. And then our last sort of um, trap in here is a pheromone trap. And in this case, you're using hormones that are actually produced by the insect or the pest to signal for mates and other things like that. Um, and you're using that in a trap so that it attracts them and it catches them. So one of the best examples of this is a Japanese beetle bag. It has a pheromone in it that attracts the Japanese beetles. So they fly toward the bag and they enter the bag, but they can't escape. And in some cases, these pheromones will also disrupt their mating cycles, and then that means they will be unable to reproduce as well. So it's a double uh, whammy for those insects. Then we also have things called reproductive controls. And in this case, you're basically releasing a large amount of sterile males. So there's two ways they do this. With most insects, they use a radiation. Um, and this radiation will basically cause sterility in these male insects. And then they release them, and they mate with the wild females. And they basically get in the way of the males that are not sterile. And since they're sterile, the eggs won't hatch. So you've now reduced your pest population pretty considerably. Now, this doesn't work on mosquitoes. So mosquitoes actually have to be genetically modified um, to be sterile. But it is another way that they're starting to look at using um, some of these techniques to control the populations. So the absolute last resort in IPM is chemical controls or pesticides. 
and they do use them but they use them only when they need them and they always try to use them in combination with other approaches so that we're not just dumping huge amounts of pesticides on the land. Um, they do tend to also try to favor botanical products over any synthetic products and try to find the least toxic options. Uh, they really are careful in how they select the chemicals and how they apply them to try to make sure that they're as uh, they have as little risk and as little toxicity to both humans and the environment as possible. So they're going to use them in conjunction with many other types of techniques. Um, and in some cases, they may use chemical controls that are very low profile, such as spraying with things like vegetable oil, dishwashing detergent. They're not toxic, but they are going to prevent some of those um, pests from inhabiting that area. So some of the benefits of IPM, it's going to protect the environment by eliminating those unnecessary pesticide applications. In many cases, it's going to be more effective and more profitable than using a pesticide. Um, it's going to reduce the risk that you're going to lose that crop because of the pest. And in a lot of cases, it's going to provide peace of mind because you know that you're doing the responsible thing. It does have some disadvantages. It does require a higher degree of management and also education. The farmer has to constantly be on top of it, thinking about what's going on, researching their pest population. So it's very labor intensive. And its success can be dependent on unpredictable types of variables, such as weather. Um, for example, you might want to lower the herbicide rate and use row cultivation to minimize weeds. Uh, but if you have an extended wet period, then you can't really um, be effective with something like row cultivation. Um, so good IPM planners always have to have alternate plans. And of course, this takes more time, too. All right, so that's IPM. And then our last alternative we're going to talk about is irradiation. And this is also known as cold pasteurization. So food can be irradiated after it's been produced, and that can be used for a number of different things. It can kill pathogens such as salmonella and E. coli. It can help to um, preserve and extend the shelf life of foods by destroying different organisms that cause spoilage and decomposition. Um, it can help to control insects uh, by killing any insects that are left over on the produce. It will also delay sprouting and ripening so that they have a longer shelf life. And you can also use it to sterilize foods and store them for years without refrigeration. And sterilized foods are particularly useful if you're in a hospital and you have patients that have severely impaired immune systems, such as AIDS and things like that. Um, so th those types of foods that are sterilized are exposed to substantially higher levels of irradiation than the irradiated foods that you'd find at your supermarket. But it's because it's going to these individuals that really can't handle any sort of bacterial contamination at all. And these are just some examples of some different foods that might be irradiated. And you can see the different purposes of each of those. Um, you can also see the dosages that each would receive. And in general, these dosages are very low. Um, they are not high enough that it's going to cause any radiation in the food. So the amount of radiation is very measured. It comes in three different forms. It's either in gamma rays, um, which come from radioactive forms of cobalt or cesium. And this is the same radiation that they use to sterilize medical, dental, and household products. It's also used for radi radiation treatment in cancer. X-rays um, could be used instead. And X-rays basically are high energy streams of electrons that are bouncing off your target. Um, substance and those x-rays again are used in medicine and industry so it's not a new technology. Um, electron beams are the last option and they're very similar to x-rays as well. They're streams of high energy electrons that are propelled from an electron accelerator into the food. And the idea is that when you radiate the food, uh, that breaks the bonds in the DNA of whatever bacterium that is on the food, and then that will kill the bacteria or make it unable to reproduce. So that's going to reduce the amount of bacteria in your food. Now, these foods do have to be labeled, and they will have this symbol on them called the radura if they are irradiated. They will usually also have a statement that tells you that they have been irradiated as well. And any finished product that has been irradiated does need to be labeled, but they do not have to tell you if any of the ingredients in a processed food have been irradiated. 
Uh, there is a lot of public perception that irradiated food might not be s safe. Um, it's probably because people don't know much about the process, and it sounds sort of scary. Um, but the FDA's official stance on this is that irradiation does not make foods radioactive. It does not compromise the nutritional quality or noticeably change the taste, texture, or appearance of the food. In fact, any changes made by irradiation are so minimal that it's not easy to tell if a food has been irradiated. Uh, safety testing of these foods has taken place since the early 1950s and they've been fed to several species of animals some up to 40 generations and they have not found adverse effects additionally these irradiated foods have been evaluated chemically to make sure there's no effects in that way and the benefits really do um, come through because when you think about things like spinach and meat where you have these E. coli outbreaks if we can prevent those we can prevent a lot of people from getting sick all right, so we're going to continue to talk about sustainable agriculture, and I want you to think about all these ways that we can integrate things like a IPM in order to make agriculture more sustainable and environmentally friendly. I'll see you tomorrow. Good night.